I don't know how to describe it other than like like a demon type of sound. But it's silhouetted, hulking, every bit of five and a half feet wide, 13 to 14 foot tall, pitch black. The one thing that ran through my mind when I had this encounter was I don't have a big enough gun. Your host, two-time witness and field researcher for more than 40 years, William Jevnik. Welcome to Creek Devil. Welcome. This story is being brought to you by William Jevening and is being narrated by me, Jim Sower. The Glenn Thomas Story I was supposed to be watching a cat skinner as he was fire trailing, but it was awful cold, and I walked a mile or so down the trail because he had no need of anyone at that time, and I thought I'd warm up and see the country. Up where he was, it was cold, and the east wind was blowing. A little further down, it was a west wind coming in. It was late fall, the last week in deer season, I think, in 1967. It was a mountain trail. They have several of them up there, footpaths, and four horses, too. The elevation was about between four and 5,000 feet. I came out lower down, into the fog, before I saw anything, and the fog was freezing on the trees because it was so cold, but if the wind would blow, the fog would break off and fall down, and, well, that made it kind of noisy. It sounded like walking. I came around a bend. Well, first I noticed some rocks that were turned over. All the other rocks were wet because of the fog, but these rocks were dry. Then I looked up, about forty or fifty feet up on a ridge of rock, and I saw these animals there. Looked like human, or just about. Large male. The female wasn't so large, and a small baby. Well, not really small. It was moving with them. It was standing up, mostly. The two older ones were squatting down and, well, sort of bending as they picked up rocks and smelled them. They were kind of careful. They moved on for a few minutes, and then finally the male found possibly what he was looking for and dug real fast down into the rocks, which were large boulders, well, not, not the round type of rocks, but the flat, sharp kind. I could not explain why these rocks were there. There hadn't been a slide or anything. They were on top of the ridge, so they wouldn't have come down from anywhere. They are loose, quite a few holes underneath them, and they are as if they had been broken up. Definitely not the round river rock type, uh, but they, the animals, would pick them up, and after they smelled them, they would lay them down on top of each other. They didn't just lay them back down where they picked them up. They stacked them up in piles. And when the male found what he was looking for, he really made the rocks fly. The big rocks weighed 50, 60, or even possible 100 pounds. He just jerked them out with his hand. He didn't seem to take any precautions for his safety. Later on, I looked, and there was some rock that could have fallen on him, but he wasn't concerned. He brought out what appeared to be a grass nest, possibly some stored hay that small rodents had stored there. He dug through that and brought out the rodents. It seems they ate them. The rodents appeared to be in hibernation or asleep or something. There were about six or eight rodents in the nest. The small animal, I noticed, only got to eat one, but the others got two or three apiece but about that time they became aware of my presence and, well, just became alert. I was alongside of this trail that follows the ridge. I didn't remember getting there, but I was squatting down beside a small tree when I became aware of where I was. As soon as they realized I was there, they suddenly began to move, real quiet, behind some low-hanging limbs on a tree there. I didn't see them again after that. I tried to follow their tracks in the direction I thought they would have to go, but I couldn't find any, although there was frost there. But the next day I found two tracks, one heel print and the front part of the foot, the toes, but they were in a different direction, 
direction from which I had come, and I never did get to connect them up with exactly which direction they had gone or know anything about them. The footprints, well, I would say there wasn't enough of, of the track to tell. Uh, they were possibly five inches wide, I, I don't know, at the widest point. They don't think they could have been six. I didn't know if it was one of the animals I had even seen that had made the footprints. I saw the toe print as it came out of the old landing. I saw the heel print as it went in. The heel print gave me the impression that the heel protruded. The tracks were in dirt. It was just as if you had a level piece and scooped it out for about two feet. And it would cave in or something. And the animal had stepped down into that and left a heel print, and as it stepped out on the other side, you could see the toe print. When I left the cat skinner, he was on Low Creek, but I had walked to Jim's Meadows, possibly a mile or more. I saw the footprints between where the cat skinner was and where I had seen the other animals. After the animals disappeared, I watched and looked for a few minutes and then decided I didn't want to go in that direction, so I just headed back. I didn't tell the cat skinner about seeing them. I didn't tell anybody about it until, well, Bob asked me to ask among my crews. Maybe some of them had seen them. That was the only time I had even mentioned it to any of the fellows out there because I didn't want anyone to think I was a nut or something or other. The only time I saw their faces was when they became alert. They gave me an impression of having a face a little like a cat you know, without the ears. I couldn't remember seeing the ears. It seemed like the nose was much flatter. It didn't stick out like a man's. The, the upper lip was very short and seemed very thin. I, I couldn't remember that it had a chin like a human has. So, somehow or other, I felt that it was a face more like a cat than a human. The male was darker than the female, dirty, dirty brown, where the female was a buckskin or fawn-colored animal. The male had much longer hair on shoulder, head, and neck, and, and hung in strings, like you see on an angora goat. He was much heavier in the shoulders than the female. From just above the hips, the, the male got larger. He had a very wide small of the back. From there on up, well, he just got bigger and bigger. Then, well, they had very rounded or stooped shoulders. The head was set lower on the shoulders than, a, than on a human. They don't seem to have the neck stand up as we do. Most of the time, they were not standing, but were squatting down, leaning forward to pick up the rocks. I didn't see them stand actually erect until the, the moment they became alert that I was there. Uh, I didn't see them walk, as such. The only movement I saw was when they made a quick, short dash to get behind the limbs of the trees. I saw them move all right, but in a humped-up, stooped-over position, just moving across the rocks. But they were upright when they made that quick dash at the end. It seemed to me that the mother picked up the baby in her lap and ran, holding the baby in front of her, possibly right below the breast, and well, her breast hung real low, much lower than on a human. I couldn't say how thick through the body these animals were, but they were very heavy set, particularly thick and heavy at the small of the back, and then on up through the ribs. I think the male was over six feet tall, but I'm an awful poor judge of height and weight or anything. I didn't think the female was as tall as the male. In fact, I think she came possibly up to his shoulder, but I saw them standing up so little, I, well, I didn't know, but they were much larger than a human, much bulkier. The baby didn't come up to the mother's hips, actually. I don't think, but I don't remember for sure. The first time I saw them standing up was as the male stepped out of the hole that he dug with the grass, but it was only a very short while until they took off. I didn't, you well, know, I didn't see them after that. Question, how did they eat? Oh, they ate just by taking it in their hand and eating it as one of us would if we were eating a banana. They ate it skin, feathers, and all, but just bit it in two. 
and as they would bite part of it, well, and then just cram the other right on in. Huh. The little one, though, he had a little more difficulty because he couldn't quite have enough room in his mouth for all of it, where the older ones did. It wasn't like a human would hand the food to the baby. He had to get his. He was scratching through the grass that, uh, that he had got, uh, and got it himself, and the female did the same thing. They gave you the impression in that way of not taking care of the baby, like people would. I've been wondering now if that group lived together as a family, and I hope to go back and look into it deeper. Question. Did you form any impression of the proportions of, say, the legs in relation to the rest of the height? Would they be like a long-legged man or short-legged? Oh, I don't know. I, I couldn't say for sure. But the arms were such that when they squat down, they have to bend forward to pick up anything. Their arms are not long enough to reach. Uh, well, this one that was digging just seemed to go right on down. I didn't remember seeing him get up, but as he was down there, well, he was just digging, and he kept on going down. And, well, at that time, I couldn't exactly see where where he was because I was down, and they were up a little bit on the side of the rock which kind of levels off some, and, well, he went down, and so I couldn't see exactly what he was doing down in there, but I did see when he came out. At that time, I was a little bit nervous, but I'm not sure now about half of it. It seemed like a bad dream for a while. I just couldn't believe it. It was really happening. I just couldn't believe, but it is. Question. Did you notice the hands at all? I noticed that it had hands. I did not notice if it had thumbs. I couldn't tell from the way it worked. It didn't seem to use the thumb, and I didn't see any ears. I didn't see any knees projecting when, when it squatted. They were in an awkward position because of the rocks, and they couldn't just squat down like we would on a floor. They would be on different levels and off too far to be comfortable. That's as close as I can explain it. When they went from place to place, they would shift in position according to the terrain. The male, well, actually both of them, seemed to be moving in a certain direction, possibly from tracing the small rodents. I thought possibly it was the scent left by the rodents coming up through the rocks, because it was not a runway that they would have been picking through, because they were just picking up the rocks any place, and as they picked it up, they'd turn it over and smell it, and then they'd lay it on the stack. They left it very different, definitely in a pile. They would leave anywhere from 3 to 15 or 20 in one pile as they would reach back, and then, oh, 6 to 8 feet farther, they'd leave another pile, starting laying them to, together and in another pile. With Renee and my daughter Catherine and son Jim, I went with this man last July to the spot where he had seen the three creatures. We found the piles of rocks to which he referred, not only at the spot he showed us, but on almost every other area of broken rock we found in two hours of scrambling around on the mountain. They were obviously piles manufactured by something or someone. The rock could not have just rested that way naturally. And there were dozens of them. The hole he saw the male Sasquatch dig was about five feet deep and almost as steep-sided as a well. No bear or anything else without hands could have lifted out the rocks. A man could undoubtedly figure out a way to do it if he had any reason to take the trouble. But in this case, the story had only come out as a result of an inquiry from someone else who had seen footprints in the snow in January of this year and there was no reason to expect that anyone would be coming out to look over the site. This ends the story. In Bigfoot history, near Orchard, Washington, early 1960s, a man from Orchard named Lopez told Roger Patterson while driving home on a foggy night with his head out the window of his car, he drove slowly around an obstruction on the road 
It turned out to be a jet black creature, eight to nine feet tall, with a flat face and no neck. It just looked at him as he went by. Greetings. This story is being brought to you by William Jevening and is being narrated by me, Jim Sower. This is the Chetco County, Oregon Monster. 1890. The Chetco Monster, sometimes called the Chetco Indian Devil. Location is about 60 miles north of Willow Creek, California, and approximately 6 miles north of the California-Oregon border. The story begins... Then one morning, enormously large human footprints were discovered along the river banks. The loggers laughingly accused one another of having feet as big as chopping blocks. Everyone from the oldest to the youngest in camp measured his footprints against those of the unknown visitor. Since no one's feet were that large, one question was bandied about repeatedly if those weren't a bear's tracks. Whose were they? The mining operation was a small one, employing a dozen men whose families lived in tents alongside the river. For several weeks, nothing unusual happened. Occasionally, garbage cans were overturned at night by marauding bears. Sometimes the beasts were so troublesome that an armed guard stood by while the loggers felled the big trees. At the campsite, mothers watched their young children closely and forbade older boys and girls to play hide-and-seek in the forest. Even when they swam in the shallow river, an adult kept a sharp lookout for bears. Someone said there was a wild man living way up the river. He was an irritable old devil who threatened to shoot anyone who approached his cabin. No matter how bad the weather was, he never wore a hat or boots. He was always bareheaded and barefooted. Barefooted? Well, then the tracks were his. With the mystery solved the, about the tracks, the, the people were happy and they promptly forgot them. But several nights later, the sound of eerie whistling and angry shrieks awakened them. In every tent, men bounded out of bed and grabbed their guns, assuming there was a wounded bear nearby. No one lighted a lamp for fear of attracting the beast, and frightened children were warned not to cry. The spine-chilling noises went on and on. Sometimes they seemed close by, other times from the direction of the road or the river, but finally the sounds faded into the distance, and quiet returned to the dark campsite. At daybreak, the men gathered to talk. They debated whether it was a bear or a mountain lion. To satisfy themselves and ease their family's worries, a uh, half-dozen men searched about for bear or mountain lion tracks. They found no mountain lion spore at all and no fresh bear tracks. However, at the edge of the clearing beyond the first stand of trees and dense undergrowth, they came upon more of the giant-sized human footprints. The men debated whether it was the old recluse. They agreed they had to catch the demented man before he killed someone. So, as quietly as possible, the search party backtracked along the line of footprints. These led them out to the road several hundred yards above the camp and up the road to the logging site. Here they found where the wild man had emerged from the forest into the open area and had prowled around tree stumps, piles of bushes, and the machinery used in loading the logs onto wagons. Then the men had a nasty shock. Massive, unwieldy tree limbs, far too heavy for one man to handle, had been pulled out of the tangled waste piles and either tossed aside like matchsticks or used to beat on the machinery. The searchers followed the tracks back down the road into the forest. For the first time, they noticed shrubs torn to pieces and saplings uprooted and whacked to shreds. This explained the thudding and snapping sounds heard during the night. The footprints circled the camp went down the well-beaten path to the river, turning back to the road, went down it half a mile and turned off into the forest. The men pressed on as far as they dared. 
However, when the tracks plunged down into a steep ravine, they stopped. The gloomy depths provided too many hiding places for a demented killer. The Chetco Indians believed there were man-animals in the woods, the logger informed his friends. He had heard the story from a white man, whom the Indians trusted enough to take into their confidence. They claimed that for generations they had shared their hunting grounds with fierce-looking, hairy creatures that walked upright like men. The strange beings were not human, nor animal, neither friendly nor hostile. They were simply there, like every other man or wild creature, so the Indians left them alone. But very late, on the third night, the frightening sounds were once again heard faintly from far off in the woods. People jerked upright in bed. As the whistling and screaming grew louder, in every tent men pulled on their trousers and boots and readied their guns. Obviously, the night howler was coming closer and closer. When he seemed only fifty feet away, one man took desperate action. Hastily fashioning a torch of oily rags and kindling, he set fire to it. Torch in one hand, rifle in the other, he raced into the woods. Meantime, the man's wife called for help. Within minutes, several men stumbled toward her in the darkness. They groaned when they learned that their comrade had gone into the woods alone. None hesitated to follow. But minutes passed while one dashed off to fetch a lantern and others supplied themselves with extra cartridges. Finally, the party headed into the forest in the direction from which the awful sounds were heard. They had covered only a short distance when the whistling and the shrieking stopped. The men halted and listened. There was a long silence. Then an outburst of bestial yowling followed by human screams. Thinking their friend was being attacked, the men fought through the undergrowth. The man with the lantern in the lead. Moments later, their comrade appeared and collapsed in their arms. At first, he was too terrified to speak. His companions fired their guns to drive off the howler and then waited patiently for the poor man to gasp out the details. He said that by torchlight, he had followed the line of giant-sized footprints and suddenly came upon a huge creature covered with hair. A bear? No, an ape, a monstrous ape, seven or eight feet tall, two axe handles wide across the shoulders. One axe handle measured 25 inches, so approximately 50 inches wide of the shoulders are approximately there, with beady yellow eyes and bared teeth. The torchlight must have blinded it because it stood back stock still and one hand shading its eyes, then it let out a tremendous roar. The man hurled his torch into his face, but instead of shooting at it, the frightened man had run screaming toward the camp. While his companions did not doubt his word, they asked anxiously if he was sure the beast was an ape. Yes, he was positive. It really looked like an ape? Yes, an ape. Did it have fangs? You bet. Claws? The man said sarcastically that he hadn't stayed around long enough to study the brute. But after thinking it over, he said it had hands like a man, only twice as large and covered with hair right down to the fingernails. After that, they all decided to return to camp. After much discussion, the loggers agreed to take turns standing guard day and night until the ape was captured or shot. Two men would patrol the campsite on two-hour watches, while the rest worked or slept. Since women present knew how to handle a gun, their assistance during the daylight hours was welcomed. The older boys and girls offered to gather firewood so that large fires could be kept blazing all night. Nothing unusual happened during the day or the early night hours, but the two whose turn came about 2 a.m. asked the men they were to relieve to stand by. They wanted to slip into the woods and really search for the ape. Reluctantly, the one patrol agreed to stand by while the relief party set out on their ape hunt. 
The hunters carried a small lantern because without some light they could not follow any tracks. But they were careful to keep the light at ground level. The rifles were loaded and the safety catches thumbed back. Not long after, they came upon bits of charred cloth amidst a welter of huge footprints. This must be where their friend had thrown his torch at the monster. Yes, there were his boot marks. After examining the area closely, they found where the ape had turned deeper into the forest instead of backtracking to the road. They followed gingerly step by step over and around ferns, shrubs, outcroppings, and rocks and massive tree trunks. What happened next could only be guessed. Apparently, the ape-like creature loomed before them. One man started shooting, while the other put down the lantern and shot, too. The patrol on guard at the campsite heard the volley of shots. They pounded each other happily. The hunters had killed the beast. But then they listened, in mounting horror, to frantic cries for help, which were drowned out by horrendous shrieks and roaring. The awful noises continued for some moments and then faded out. The silence was even more frightening to the guards. They shouted for help and soon were surrounded by armed loggers and their wives. After a hasty explanation, all the men plunged into the woods, leaving the women to build up the fires and protect the children. The searchers shouted, swung lanterns, and fired their guns so that their friends would know that help was on the way. After advancing some distance, they stopped briefly and called to the men. When neither responded, they fired shots. No answering shots were heard. Once more the party advanced. Before long they came upon a gruesome sight. Their friends were dead. Judging from the blood stains, their bodies had been slammed against tree trunks and torn to pieces. A trail of blood-smeared footprints led off into the forest. The beast obviously had been wounded, but no man present was willing to track it through the dark forest. Some did volunteer to gather up the remains of their unfortunate comrades, while others returned to camp for blankets and to break the sad news. Within 24 hours, the campsite was deserted. The logging operation was moved to another location. A professional hunter with trained hounds was hired to assist hunters in tracking down the savage beast. It was never captured, nor its voice, ever heard again. The most people could hope for was that it had crawled into a well-hidden lair and died. This is the end of the reading. Thank you for listening. Thanks for listening to this episode of Creek Devil. If you or anyone you know has had an encounter with these creatures, please contact us at williamjevning at yahoo.com. That's William, J-E-V-N-I-N-G, at yahoo.com. All communication is confidential. Join us for another program next week. And until then, keep your eyes open out there.